Hey everybody, Terry Welbrock here. Just wanted to thank you for being here and being a part of this healing space. Uh, this is my soul work, as I've said often on this show and on my social media accounts. Um, so yeah, I just feel compelled to put this beautiful light of hope out into the world with these interviews and uh, just this inspiration that's happening in the world right now. I just, I don't know, I feel as if there's a darkness that's trying to overcome us. And you look on social media and you look on the news and it's just so overwhelming, but there's so much goodness and there's so much light and uh, we just need to focus on that. So that is my goal with this show. And again, I just, uh, I thank you for being here. Again, if you want to go to um, my academy.terrywellbrock.com, I have some courses on there, and I have a um, some coaching that I just started to utilize as well. So be sure to go visit that. Visit terrywellbrock.com, T-E-R-I-W-E-L-L-B-R-O-C-K, and you can sign up for my monthly Hope for Healing newsletter. And be sure to go to the YouTube channel or uh, the Facebook page or any of the audio outlets and subscribe. Um, the podcast just hit downloaded in 100 countries. Woohoo! So that's a big uh, that's a big milestone. We're, we're now in 100 countries. All right. Well, this was a, a great interview coming up. So stay tuned. Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place podcast. I'm your host, Terry Welbrock, and so excited to have with me today David Brower, a.k.a. the Sensorial Guy. So welcome, David. Thank you, Terry. This is beautiful to be here with you today. Yes, I'm, I'm just so excited to talk to you about the work you're doing in the world. You had a book release in March, and um, I just told you I was watching a video that you had out on YouTube on romantic love and romance, and oh, it just so touched my heart, so I love it. So give us a little brief intro on, on who you are and what you're doing. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who's been looking for love and loves to love. And so I've been finding my own ways to engage with that throughout my whole life, uh, whether it's pursuing uh, professional activities I love or really finding someone to spend my life with romantically who uh, I absolutely loved. And yeah, just really believing that life is at its core really about loving it. And that involves, you know, lots of different aspects, including trusting it, uh, including savoring it, appreciating it, being in gratitude and, and getting through the, the times that are not so easy or desired or, you know, and still in spite of all loving life. And so uh, all my work is turned towards um, supporting, helping people to connect with that, to uh, really value that and to pursue a life that includes uh, what they what they really love and so that takes a lot of learning about yourself uh, you know we we kind of mistake a lot what we want or feel we need in life and so yeah i'm trying to find many ways to connect with people and to help them connect with themselves and others and the life that they love and to live that life to go after that life beautiful and what a what an amazing way to approach life. And I know I had told you I find hearts everywhere. And I just, I use the <laughs> hashtag love is all around us a lot because That's it good. truly is just uh, an essence, an energy, and it really is all around us. And in so many, I, I find it in nature a lot. <laughs> um, and, it, and again, it's just this, it's just this beautiful essence. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, it's a way to save ourselves, right? It's a way to, to support ourselves, to not fall on to, you know, live too much in the dark side, you know, to not be taken over by, um, you know, whether it's fear or scarcity or um, lack of hope or grief or sorrow or sadness, et cetera. It's, Love is a is a container that can withhold that all and can also help us to to find our way out of that, of course. Yeah. And you just mentioned grief and and that was one of the subjects I wanted to bring up with you is that you had grief in your life. 
And is that when I was that the inspiration for writing your book? Yeah, that's the main was the main inspiration. Uh, you know, having lost uh, my wife of 27 years, and I wanted to to write an allegory, something that would be an eternal reminder to myself and an honoring and also an opening to what's what's here now and what's to come and to love life again and to trust life again and to savor life again and enjoy life again and um, reconnect with that vibration again of love, you know, um, which I, I clearly need to be, I, I feel we, a lot of us do, to be reminded of more, you know, more frequently so I don't uh, go down some um, path of thinking or feeling or being or interpreting, uh, you know, or framing something in a way that it doesn't really serve me to to live my greatest life in spite of it all. Uh, we're all going to go through challenges at one level or another, and it's really how are we going to choose to to go through that? Which you know, what are we going to um, um, lean into, and uh, what are the, what's the way we're going to be, and what are the the lifestyle choices and the practices and um, you know, people will spend our time with and work that we want to do and like what's what's going to give our life meaning. Uh, and of course, I want to mix pleasure with purpose. This is really where performance in life comes for me is to be able to overlap those. And yeah, you need to let the energies and the emotions go through you when something like grief happens and, you know, a lot of, a lot of crying, a lot of letting go and a lot of... Uh, you know, releasing senses of feeling sorry for yourself or like a victim or some kind of scarcity or, you know, I'll never find love again or, you know, these types of things. And that's, it's not really very useful after you've, I want to suggest, done a, a healthy, you know, grieving. And so my book was a, a, a way to get this across in an allegorical fashion to tell a story and not just be sort of a... Um, you know, a self-help book or something like this. That's, I wanted it to be more poetic and more artistic and, um, you know, let people get something unique out of it. That's part of where they are, whatever it is in their life that they're going through. And, and interestingly, when people read the book, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later, but when people read the book, every time they read it, they get something kind of new or different out of it. There's a nuance or a layer or a message which they hadn't really gotten the first time because uh, maybe they're more present, maybe something else is going on in their life. They've had some, a little bit of a consciousness that's opened up from the book or something else. And so it's uh, it's quite fascinating to experience that. Even myself, uh, I listened to the audio version, which is beautiful. Uh, it's my narration, uh, which is not the beautiful part, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> I know it's a world-class <laughs> production. Uh, with uh, an original music composition by uh, a friend named Viara Ivanova Dietrich. And so the both uh, together is quite a, a, a great way also to experience it. And, you know, I'm still every single time, like I get attached to some new kind of um, idea or something that comes out of it that speaks to me, given kind of what I'm going through. And And that's really what I wanted to achieve for others and offered others is this uh, this connection to um, kind of like a friend who's kind of highlighting a little bit something different to you and say, hey, did you really, you know, just kind of take a look here. You know, what yeah. are you feeling? What are you sensing right now in this moment? And be present and intimate to that. Yes. Well, and I could just tell by reading the reviews on Amazon and just uh, what a profound impact it has on on people and and again, just such a beautiful gift. Yeah. Now the title of it is uh, Dance of the Love Caterpillars. That's right. And copy. it's a, it's a, it's a copy. Of yeah, there That's you go. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a yeah. romantic, poetic, got... with illustrations. Yes. With the extraordinary yeah. original illustrations by Cheryl Vanderpoel. Yeah, it's quite... Uh... It's quite a special gem. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. Oh my gosh. So now, how do can people get a hold of it through uh, through your website, through bookstores? Uh, you can get through my website. You can find it on Amazon. You can um, probably order it at your bookstore. Um, 
they contact Ingram Spark um, and or you can go to bookshop.org if you're in the US and you can order it there, which is a way to support local bookstores also. Yeah. Now you're okay. coming and to that, us from Paris, correct? That's right. Yeah. I love it. I, I I just get so excited because this podcast has been downloaded uh, last ch I checked 94 different countries and so wow. I interview folks from all over the world and so Amazing. yeah you're my first one coming from Paris so <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah beautiful <laughs> I love the city of love which I love as well that and that's the work you're doing in the world so yeah yeah Awesome. Awesome. So now do you have any uh, courses? Do you, do you coach people? Do you have, what, how, how do you engage with folks? Yeah, I do coaching, um, you know, call it uh, life coaching, abundant life coaching. And uh, I also uh, put on live events, which has been a little bit um, postponed for the moment. Uh, I have something called Sensorial Experience Day, which is about bringing people to their senses. And it's kind of a, a luxury um, culinary food party uh, that's um, disguising really a conscious awakening, um, human connection and expansion uh, experience through a pleasurable uh, moment with people in an intimate setting. Uh, and so it's, it's quite a beautiful, uh, a quite a beautiful experience. And it's, again, it's sort of, um, well, it is a uh, kind of a link to uh, what I call sensorial intelligence and a lifefulness. There are two philosophies and concepts and lifestyles that I talk a lot about, um, which is, you know, this sense of kind of, there's a middle road between yes and no, uh, between black and white. Um, you know, there's all these colors of the rainbow and it's really for us to get to know ourselves and in our connections with others to to seek out these nuances and these uh, this variety and these differences and these distinctions. And uh, in doing so, we're really appreciating life more and we're savoring it more and we can then be even more in gratitude than ever. And from here, we live a life that's uh, way more enriching and it's not like Groundhog's, Groundhog's Day, uh, you know, hedonic adaptation and even all the conditioning and some of the, you know, mental cognitive bias shortcuts that we've been um, trained by society or the way we've been brought up or the traumas that have happened to us. Uh, by using your senses, you can actually come to a more present relationship with them, something more intimate. And if you're open to allow yourself to kind of feel and experience that really with an open heart and with love, uh, you're able to have actually a way more expansive and healthy, um, vibrant life that's full of more well-being. And sure, it's, you know, it's kind of easier said than done. There's no doubt about that. But the already the raising of the awareness that you can actually experience life more openly, more bravely, and let the cheers come or let the, you know, crazy ecstatic, uh, uh, moments arrive. And for me, that's really what being alive is about is kind of allowing this kind of um, Richter, you know, kind of stock market thing to, to happen that you're not, uh, you're not not allowing yourself to experience sensations, emotions, um, you know, experiences that could even be as simple as, you know, maybe you don't eat oysters, uh, or maybe you need to want to stretch yourself to actually experience what that's about. What are people raving about? Why is that such a, a delicacy? You know, uh, get, kind of get over your own kind of thinking that something is a way that it is and be a little bit more intimate with it, try and explore, get curious again, like we were when we were kids, you know? And so it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot around that to aliven people again, to, to living it again. It really feels like right now, um, people have been, you know, home a lot. Uh, people are kind of going through social anxiety to like reconnect with each other again. And so it's a really opportune moment to lean into uh, in everyone's kind of own way, own speed, own style, et cetera, to lean into stretching ourselves, to um, use pleasure as the doorway uh, to actually um, getting back to living, you know, this life that's really meaningful and purposeful and 
and, and at the end for me, uh, performant. And so as much as I can overlap that, like with food, I'm big on food. You know, I cook like crazy. My events have food. Um, and, you know, I think there's a way of not being so like pleasure driven with food, almost in an addictive way, maybe, or impulsive way, you know, like, uh, I, I'm not sure eating cotton candy, even if you love it, like every, every day or every weekend is going to be a really good idea, but maybe there's something else sweet that you love that's either homemade or made in a special way. That's actually, you know, got a little bit of healthiness in there. And um, there's lots of things, you know, fresh strawberries in season, um, you know, eating dates or, uh, yeah, there's so many things you just got to find things, but so that we kind of live in a way that's um, really supporting a, a beautiful, healthy life, but it's also super pleasurable, right? And you kind of train yourself to live like this. So it's not, uh, you're not just uh, on autopilot, you're way more present and, and learning to experience things with almost an HD high definition uh, way of, uh, uh, of of sensing them. And so suddenly like life is, you know, like you're talking about being hearts everywhere. Um, me, it's just kind of the same thing with, you know, when I'm eating to make a really beautiful table, no matter what happens, like no plastic on my table, nothing with labels, take it out of the container and put it into a nice little bowl, use a proper uh, fabric napkin, you know, use nice silverware, sit properly, whether I'm by myself or with others, and honor that moment, celebrate that moment, savor that moment and get way more, maximize that moment. So, you know, you're living life really to the the fullest. And I feel when we live like this, we can't have any regrets, whether it's with ourselves or with others and or the experiences we live in. We're yes. giving our full self to it. Yeah. yeah. And listening to you talk, you just talk poetically. I'm just mesmerized because I, I'm, I'm drawn into it and I, I just love it. I can, I can just feel it and sense it. Mm. Um, and That's another thing that... Thank you. One of the things that you said was talking about the rainbow and I had, I had done a meditation. I talked this about this a few weeks ago on the show, but I'd done this meditation and, and during it, I, it was, it was pretty powerful, deep meditation, but I saw a color blue that I'd never seen before. And during this meditation, and I thought to myself, as I came back out of it, like, there is so much more that we don't see or allow ourselves to see that's available to our senses or, or to experience. And so it just, it just, it was a little awakening moment for me to just be a little more aware of and open to uh, more that, that surrounds me. Um, and the third thing that I wanted to bring up was, as you talked, I do a lot of mindfulness practice, but it's through my senses. And so it, it, it that's what's resonating with me is that it's just a, mm -hmm. a lot of being present in the now in the moment through the sense of smell and sight and touch and all of that yeah and um my uh my belief is that we can take that actually to another level with the you know savoring and celebration and sort of what i call the sensorial side of things and maybe that's related to pleasure etc it's you know it's it's like wow you discovered this new like blue like like <laughs> you know how, how are you going to give that value how are you going to make that meaningful because uh, when you start to do that you start to live way more in a sense of really like daily awe and wonder and you know this really translates to all the other aspects of your life. So it could be in your work, it could be in your relationships. Imagine the little nuance that you just suggested that you suddenly see in the person that you've been in the house with for like the last 12 months and you can't see them anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me, cause you're just like kind of, even if you love them, but you just like, it feels like it's Groundhog's Day, right? And so, so imagine that that's happening with this person that you're kind of, you know, you're kind of fed up with, you're kind of bored with, yeah, I'm characterizing, but that suddenly you notice something that you didn't notice before because you're actually looking at it with more um, noticing and observing eyes. You know, you're really like, like, I never noticed that you had triangular eyelashes. Like, like that's so beautiful. And like to express it and externalize it and notice it and celebrate it you actually take yourself into a more savoring sense after you're in the mindfulness, which is really the base of it, right? The fundamental of coming to the present moment with your awareness and guiding it. 
and then really valuing that afterwards, celebrating that, making that something that is meaningful and worthwhile is to me how we raise our life satisfaction. It's to me the way that we actually love life uh, and all the different aspects that people and the experiences we're having is by by that and externalizing that and sharing what you're experiencing. Even when you're by yourself, sharing and externalizing that. And yeah, drawing out the pleasure, noticing it and finding value in it. Uh, even think like if you're doing something repetitive, like you go on a bike ride every day, you know, you're probably say you're on the same bike ride every day, but you've kind of lost the connection with like what you're passing through, what you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're sensing. And yeah. it's like, you're not even there. You're lost somewhere, right? Which maybe is good sometimes, but there are other times like you want to bring this mindfulness back in and just to be able to realize like how fortunate am I to be cycling through this forest? Like look at the color of the trees, feel the wind on my face as I'm cycling along. Wow, my muscles that I can feel are working. I actually have muscles that feel good these days. That's great. You know, or like I feel myself sweating or my breath is going pretty hard. And it's like, wow, that's such a great sensation. And then you even translate that into like, I'm doing something that's pleasurable and look how healthy it is for me also. Like I'm, I'm exercising my body and I'm surrounded in this beautiful environment. I'm breathing in the air from the trees. And like you've suddenly created like, uh, you know, a mindset through this mindfulness and adding on this sensoriality, this pleasure, this savoring, this celebration. And life is like this beautiful thing that you really start to just love more and more because you're you're way more attached to it. And again, it's like when you, you know, it's like a romantic love affair that you're having. But romance, you know, romance takes attention. Romance takes focus and energy. And then the amplification of that so that we, you know, recognize and acknowledge it and freshen it. It's like a fresh dish every day. Um, if we lose connection, even if you have the, you know, the spouse that cooks the best food in the world, at some point, that's going to seem kind of like a normal. And you're going to disconnect from maybe even saying that you like it, you know, or it'll be one word, oh, this is great. Well, what's great about it? Why don't you give me a few sensorial descriptions and like, what does it remind you of? What are you smelling? What are you tasting? What's, you know, so there's a lot more depth. Uh, and I think, you know, this colorful aspect, this range within us can be opened as we come back to our senses more um, and find that doorway and then amplify that, you know, with savoring and appreciation and obviously some gratitude and, and celebration and, and love. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Gosh, I want to know, were you with me on the bike ride yesterday? Because <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was, you were so describing what I do as I, as I ride. We moved to, <laughs> it's great. yeah, it's awesome. We moved to Hilton Head Island uh, last year. It'll be a year and a couple of weeks. And so I, I try to ride my bike daily and I do that. I, I see the squirrel and I'm like, hi, little buddy. And uh, just <laughs> the, the fly, like I am in awe, yeah. in awe of everything around me. And it's been a year and so I great. hope it never goes away. As a matter of fact, I asked, we started to play bocce ball and I asked one of the gentlemen we were playing against. And so we were chatting and I said, how, ma how many years have you lived here? And he said, uh, 24, 24 years, I think. And I said, so are you still pinching yourself that you live here? And he said, every day. And I said, okay, good. Cause I hope I don't lose it because it, it is being just here in this moment of riding my bike. And I said to myself yesterday, which was so weird. Oh, I can feel my muscles and my legs getting stronger. Cause I've been doing this for a year now. And I just was paying attention to everything that was going on. Oh, yeah. That's it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I live in Paris and I feel I feel very fortunate when I ride around with my bike, et cetera, also. Like I'm a lifetime tourist. That's all yeah. I say to myself all the time. Because when you get when you get into hedonic adaptation, you get onto into transactional living and you're so caught up in succeeding and you're so caught up in getting it done and doing and all these kinds of things, and all of that is useful and necessary and you know, et cetera. But when we get so caught up in that and so addicted to that, that that's our main source of getting satisfaction. And like, we don't understand really what to do with the rest in some ways. We've kind of lost uh, our touch uh, with the, the presence of like how lucky and fortunate we are to live the lives we lead 
And, you know, I think particularly for people who lead pretty good lives, you know, this, this can be quite a trap, you know, to fall into the sensation like it's almost as if it's never enough. Uh, it's got to be better and better. And when you get into this sort of thing, uh, you lose connection with appreciating already what you have and where you are and how healthy you are and, and the joyful moments, et cetera. It doesn't mean that we don't want to progress in life. It doesn't mean we may not, you know, want more. Uh, but at the same time, you know, not being able to connect with the everyday experiences, which is really at the end of the day for me, it's really at the end of the day, which life's make, uh, what makes life, uh, you know, worth living are these daily moments, uh, you know, just all kind of added together. Um, you know, what is, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. I love it. Well, and I, one, another thing that you mentioned uh, just popped back into my head was the word awakening. And do you think that there's more and more folks who are really, I think it's, it's our um, innate nature to be at peace, to be in joy, to be in this place of love and we've we've gotten lost along the way do you find that more people do you think are being drawn to that and wanting that and craving that i frankly i feel kind of incapable of measuring measuring or knowing that i i do sense that there's been surely an awakening uh, we've been shaken up by what's happened in the last uh, last year and now it's a question of, again, do we fall back into our usual cognitive biases and shortcuts and, you know, this sort of feast or famine, right? I mean, um, I certainly know in American culture, it seems like, you know, when things are good, um, people are spending money and doing things. When things are bad, people stop spending and stop doing things. And so I just, I wonder, I hope, I wish that where we can learn from what's been happening that, you know, maybe in periods of feast, we should have a little bit of um, austerity and deprivation that's voluntarily uh, chosen so we can keep sort of a balance and a level headedness about this as sort of peaceful, you know, it's, it's kind of another way of being sort of in the equanimity as maybe the Buddhists would uh, call it. So that we're not so sort of like, you know, this going on, that there's more softer, kind of curve. And I'll give you some real life examples of that. You know, for example, you know, take cold showers, uh, even if you have hot water, right? Um, eat in uh, with, by candlelight, even though you have electricity, right? Um, you know, don't, it's almost like you don't need to buy the latest bicycle that's the fanciest, etc., to actually have a really great biking experience, where you actually get a great workout. And it's, pleasurable and you know just because you don't have the bike that's five levels up doesn't mean that it's not as good a biking experience you know so i just i hope and wish that there's been some of an awakening to come back to uh you know like not wasting so much uh, uh energy resources uh you know even in our relationships that we're maybe more focused on what's more essential uh, what uh, what means more to us uh, in our connection with others, like who we want in our lives, uh, and even you know food wise, what um, what's really nourishing to me, uh, just kind of make better decisions about our our lives, and you know to share that wealth with others as we take care of our own decisions and our own uh, way of being. Uh, that's what emanates onto to others, right? Yeah. I was in uh, I was in uh, Dharamsala uh, with uh, Sandong Rinpoche, and we also got to spend some time with a small group of forty people with the Dalai Lama. And you know, after four days of spiritual uh, training there, the message uh, that we got when we had come there to kind of save the world with some program I was involved with, you know, it was kind of save the world summit or something you know, the message at the end was go home and work on yourself. And that's how you'll save the world. You know, mic drop. <laughs> right. So same thing with your health, same thing with your wealth, same thing with your relationships. 
You know, it all starts with yourself and your responsibility towards yourself. And then of course, bringing that in into the world. It's not about just going and meditating in an ashram or, or you know, even being mindful is not, doesn't mean that your life necessarily changes. It's kind of what you do with that yeah. after that, how you integrate that, how that inter interacts with actually your, your world. So, I mean, that's super insightful. Like, you know, you want a kinder world, well, be kinder. It's like, you know, be the change you want to be, of course, uh, as I believe the Dalai Lama has also said. So that's my wish. That's my hope. Uh, it does feel like there's a certain kind of person that's more conscious, more awakened, uh, you know, while at the same time, you know, people continue to disagree. I think that's kind of the nature of of life. Uh, and it's really hard today, I feel, to like know what is truth and what's not, what's fiction, what's lying, what's manipulation, what's, it's, yeah. it's kind of complicated. So, you know, we have to kind of work through that as we understand what's our place uh, in the world. And hopefully as we get to know ourselves better and we start to take care of some of these things about ourselves, we can live a more healthy life. And that definitely emanates onto the world, the way we act, the way we behave, how we spend our money, time and resources, you know, how we treat people, how we act, um, even in our work. And as our world changes for us, other people's worlds start to change uh, for them also. And you demonstrate it, you're not just talking about it. Yeah. So there it feels like there's a bit more there. Yes, beautiful. Well, thank you for your insights on that. Yes. I, I love it that people will now tag me on Facebook posts and say, I was making my egg this morning and it was shaped like a heart. And I mean, so I mean, people are becoming, <laughs> That's great. yeah, they're becoming more cognizant or more awakened to that, I guess, and finding hearts it's because I, I'm always throwing it out there. So yeah, we can have an impact. <laughs> yeah. And that's good. And it's, it's a lot about people expressing it also, right? That you actually realize it. like, I congratulate and applaud the people that are actually, you know, say what they are experiencing and taking yeah. and using in their lives. You know, the more that we do that, the more that we start to realize together that this stuff means something. That little thing of doing a heart is a big thing, right? But if people don't share it, you know, so you got to, you got to right. share it and externalize it. And it's huge. That's great. That's so great. Yeah, for sure. And I have to put an exclamation point on your, on your bike story, because I, I again, I, I was talking to at bocce ball, <laughs> another, another gentleman, an older gentleman, and he just chatting about what do you do? Where do you work? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, Oh, I do. I bike to the South end of the Island. We live on the North end. Every, and I volunteer is uh, like, he helps tourists who are visiting um find things and so i forget what he called himself like a like a bike guide or something i i i'm butchering it i don't know but i said oh my gosh that's pretty that's a pretty hefty bike ride down there and back and he said he, i i asked him so do you have like a, a nice 10 speed or what kind of bike? And he said, no, I have my dad's 92 year old steel framed bike that I ride. It doesn't have gears. And so I thought, but he started talking about how it belonged to his dad when his dad was a boy. And then it has, was passed on to his, his, his dad's brother, his uncle. And there was such a connection to that bike. And so that's what it was about was to this, this time spent riding on this bicycle every day. And I just thought that was beautiful. So amazing. Yeah. It just goes to show. Exactly. It just goes to show. It's not about, you know, the shiny bling bling luxury, et cetera. It can be. Um, I have right. some friends who are 80 who just brought electric bikes. Oh, and yeah. These are incredible athletes who do, you know, but finally at 80, they give themselves permission to buy electric bikes, you know, but then they go on crazy rides up mountains and, you know, do kind <laughs> of things that probably most people couldn't do anyway, uh, even with an electric bike. But yeah, it's, it's really a, there's so much there already in our lives. And yeah. if we're constantly looking for more and not projecting that we don't feel enough and falling into a consumerist kind of way of being, uh, 
and you know we're just buying a lot of stuff because other people are buying it or you know it's I, I just would be cautious uh, we, as a society i hope that we're a bit more cautious about that given what we've gone through and realizing that first of all a lot of people we we need to preserve our finances so that we can you know be safe and taken care of in times of fast in times of crisis in times of unpredictable unseen uh, you know tragedies uh, and such and so it doesn't mean not don't live a like great life full of pleasure and beauty uh, you know gosh i sure sure i'm all for that at the same time you know getting too lost in that to me almost feels like addiction it almost feels like uh, an overly hedonic kind of connection with the with the world and and almost as if it's pleasure just for pleasure's sake yeah uh, you know uh I mean, how many of us have bought things that we don't really use, you know, over the years or, you know, and that's how life is, you know, don't always follow through the instrument, the piano, the whatever it is, you know, but just to be mindful uh, and attentive, I think today about that. And your bike story is so great because it's like, you know, this guy is so attached to this and loves this. I mean, what, why would, you know, someone would could say to him, like, do you have money problems? Like, right. uh, you know, what, you know, why are you writing that thing? Look at him kind of strange, you know, you, and then start using words like you should, you should buy a new bike. I'm like, like, what are you, like, excuse me, this is my existence and I'm determining and authoring how I appreciate it and what means something to me. And thank you for that. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, uh, but it's there's more a lot the there. The more the soul part of it for him in that heart, yeah, that heart and soul connection to that bike. Yeah. yeah. I, I just found it. I, I just, my reaction was, oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> like, I thought it was awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, anything that uh, we haven't been able, that you wanted to share that we haven't touched upon yet? You know, I just, I'm just really trying to, express and share that we want to savor life as much as possible and you know i wanted to go to the grave with on my grave and i want this for everybody really you know like no one loved life as much as, as terry david you know uh, that that this is what we can do is just love it so much because when we're loving we're not in a space of uh of disappointment or scarcity uh or comparison or a sense of lack or even like caught in some kind of a pattern or conditioning which makes us feel like we're not enough we've never been enough we'll never be enough it's never enough and all of these types of things and if we can come back to love for ourselves and also for others so that they also um, can live this, this kind of a space in this kind of a way i just feel like the the world can continue to be a a better place in a way that's you know loving and pleasurable but it's leading and it actually is purposeful um, in the way that it's done right it's useful it's meaningful and and this for me is how we raise and elevate the performance of ourselves in life and also in the world is uh, you know to approach it this way so to constantly be reconnecting uh, with that, I have a nice mantra. Can I share a mantra that I do? Sure, please. <laughs> it's called the last mantra. <laughs> so it's, I love life and life loves me. I appreciate life and life appreciates me. I savor life and life savors me. I trust life and life trusts me. Beautiful. Yes. Oh my gosh. And it touched my, when you said savor, I felt it in my heart. My heart actually like tingled a little bit. So that's yeah. awesome. I love it. Thank you. Sweet. All right. Well, again, how do folks get in touch with you and find you? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook, David Brower, uh, and Instagram at the sensorial guy, the sensorial guy. And my website is www.davidbrower.com. It's also uh, called Alive Fullness, Alive Fullness. And yeah, those are probably the main ways to reach out to me and find out more.
Sure. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much for being here and shining your beautiful light and uh, sharing your insights. Absolutely. I'm, I'm honored that you invited me to come. Thank you, Terry. Absolutely. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And remember, until next time, be gentle with yourself. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> hey, everybody. Terry Welbrock again. Just wanted to thank you for listening to the episode today and remind you to visit my website as well as the Academy terrywellbrock.com for the courses but if you go to my website terrywellbrock.com you can sign up for my monthly hope for healing newsletter which is also jam-packed with information and strategies and blog pieces and guest blog pieces and links to shows um, and just a great space for uh, again healing and hope strategies Thanks for, again, being here and being a part of this healing space. I very much appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye.